Welcome back students. I wanted to add another lecture to this course on some more security issues because I recently took a course myself to learn more about this and I think we did pretty good so far in this course. So there's a few things that we could do to improve and I wanted to make sure that I let you guys know about that. But the first line of defense against any kind of hacking attack on your website is going to be controlling access to your web page. Because if a hacker can't get to your web page, they can't use it to gain access to your data or anything like that. And that's the whole purpose of this course that you just took, is creating a secure login and content management system so you can control who has access to your web page. Because when we're creating web applications that can access your database server, especially when you're working with live data like we are, you don't want anybody to be able to get in and mess that up. You want to control who's allowed to do that. Now there are a few really common types of attacks and this is going to be kind of a brief overview. If you're really concerned about data security, I'd recommend that you take a course on ethical hacking. There are a few available on Udemy that are very popular because there's no better way to understand the vulnerabilities of your website than to learn how hackers attack those vulnerabilities and how you can protect against them. So as a subject matter, that's really beyond the scope of this course and it's beyond my expertise to teach. I'm a GIS guy, I'm not a computer guy, but there are still some simple things that you should know about that can help eliminate a huge amount of risk. In addition to just controlling access to your web page, not allowing people that you don't explicitly give permission to to view it. So a couple common types of attacks. The first one is called SQL injection. I've talked about this in some of the prerequisites to this course, so you should have a little bit of familiarity with it. Basically what you're doing is you're using your knowledge of SQL and knowledge of how server-side web applications work in order to take control of your database and do some damage in there. So for instance, you could enter something into a text box like what's here in red. So maybe something like a single quote, semicolon, and then another SQL command like drop table users. And then what happens when that data is converted to a SQL statement, you'll get something like this. Select star from users where username equals, and then where they were expecting a username to be entered into the text box, they get something like drop table users. And SQL will interpret this as an empty string where username equals blank, and then it'll see the semicolon and say, okay, there's another statement coming, and it'll execute that statement. And that statement does something horrible to your database like drop an entire table of users. And then what normally would have been following after the username is just a SQL statement that's going to cause an error. It's not a valid SQL statement, but it doesn't matter because the damage has already been done. And the solution to this issue is to use PDO prepared statement. Anytime that you're building a SQL statement that's based on input from the user, you want to use a PDO prepared statement. That's what I've taught in this course for this very reason. It's amazing. I've taken a number of courses on building login and registration systems, and none of them talked about using PDO. So just the very login and registration system that they were teaching was very vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. So you're already ahead of a lot of other people just by taking this course. Now, the hacker does need information about your database for this to be useful. They have to know, for instance, the name of the table for this to be effective. Now they could guess and just say drop table users under the assumption that, hey, just about every database out there has a users table, right? So you can provide a little bit of protection by not using common names like users. Like maybe you might say, maybe the name of your company. So uh, the name of our company was Imaginary Environmental. Maybe you say IE users or something like that. And it's a lot less likely that somebody could guess that name and do damage. And it's also helpful if you're only expecting a username and maybe you have a limit of 15 characters on that username. Don't allow them to enter more than 15 characters into that text box, right? So in order even to do this very simple bit of damage, they need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So they, if you only allow them 15 characters, they would only be able to drop a table that had one character. So you can provide some protection that way, but really prepared statements is the best way to do it and provides a lot of security because prepared statements not only will escape these special characters and tell PostgreSQL to just interpret them as a single quote, not as a special character, what the single quote represents 
which is terminating a string, and just interpret the semicolon as a string semicolon and not as a special character that tells Postgres that another SQL statement's about to start. And so you want to do this anyway because you want to allow your users to enter a single quote, even if it's just oftentimes used as an apostrophe and it's just punctuation that you want to allow your users to enter into a text box. It's going to cause problems even if they're not trying to do anything bad. It's going to cause problems if they have that apostrophe S as an abbreviation for that is and they try and do that. It's going to cause problems if you don't escape your text. So you want to do this anyway. But another way that hackers can get information about your database is through your error messages. And so we've had our error messages. We've used them a lot while we were developing in localhost and that's very helpful but once you move your application to a live server where people can access it you want to turn off all the error messages and one way to do that is using the php function error reporting zero that will turn off error messages another way in pdo itself we can tell it explicitly how we want to handle errors and right now we have it handling errors as exceptions and that allows us to use our try catch block because we're catching PDO exceptions and handling it. But we can turn that off as well so we won't get any database errors. And those are the ones that we're primarily concerned about. But the normal PHP errors can also provide some information to a hacker. So let's go take a look at how we would do this in our code. So right now in our includes, we have an init PHP file that's run at the top of every page. And you can see right here, when we create a database connection, we pass it as PDO error mode exception. And so we can turn off these database errors. Let's see, let's Google, well, we're already in the PHP documentation. So let's Google PDO error mode. And the first thing that comes up is a link to the PDO documentation. And here it tells us the different error modes we have. Exception is what we're using now. Warning is an option. But silent is what we actually want to do. So we're going to change that to silent. And that means that when we get a database error, the program's just going to end, nothing's going to happen. But the user won't see an error message. And so they won't get any information about how our database is structured. And then there's a couple other security issues. One of those things is that we can hide our directories. Right? So right now, if I go back to my web page and say I type in content, which I know is one of the directories in my web application, then localhost is returning all the files in that folder. And that can also provide a hacker with some information they might want to use, the names of our files. Hopefully they don't have access to our server, so it won't help them much. But if they can get in and see the code that's in these PHP files, then they might understand how your application works and they can use that to attack you. So we don't want them to see the names of our files, is an easy way to prevent that and that's by creating a little configuration file called period ht access and i'll put that in the directory that you want to hide and the only thing that's in that file it's just a text file the only thing that's in that file is this text options with a capital o a space a dash and then indexes with a capital i and that prevent, will prevent the user from seeing the index to that directory and so let's go do that. So right now, if we just have a directory that doesn't have a, a index.html or index.php file in it, it's going to show us the contents of that directory. But if we go in to our content directory, we'll create a new file called .htaccess. And this just provides some directives that you can give to Apache. This file is read by Apache anytime it loads a web page, and you can put some things in here to control it. Now what all you can do is beyond the scope of this course, I'm just going to show you this one thing. And that is options, again, a space, a dash, and indexes with capital letters. And I'll save that, and then I'll go back, and when I refresh this, now I get access forbidden. You don't have permission to access a requested directory. So that's going to prevent hackers from seeing your file names and maybe using that. This should already be done. If you're using a hosted web server, this should already be the default option on that server. But you can test it this way, and you can include that HT access file anyhow. Now, something else that you can do to make your site a little bit more secure is you can hide the cookies 
in the browser. And we can do that when we create a cookie. Remember, we use a set cookie. And I've already told you, it takes the name of the cookie, a value for the cookie, and an expiration date. But there are some more optional parameters. Path allows you to give it the name of a path on your server in your directory. And a cookie will only be accessible from files in that path. Domain is similar, but it allows you to give it a subdomain. And your cookie will only be valid in that subdomain. Secure takes either true or false. And if it's true, a cookie will only be accessible if your site is accessed through a secure server. So you can turn that on to true if you want. The default is false. But this other one is the one that we're going to look at. It's HTTP only. And what that does, if you set that to true, the cookie is only going to be accessible through the HTTP header, which means it's only going to be accessible from the server. It won't be accessible in the browser anymore. Because right now, let's go back to our login course. And so if we open our Google development tools, and go to the console, we can just console out document.cookie variable that's accessible from JavaScript. And see, it already has a cookie in here that has the name of our session. And this is something that, again, is beyond the scope of this course, but it's how your web page internally uses sessions in PHP. Now, if we log in, and I click Stay Logged In, remember, that's when we create a cookie is when this is checked. And then I click Logged In. So now I'm logged in, and there's a cookie set, remember? So now if I access that variable from within JavaScript, now I see we have two cookies. One is username and Miller, and then we also have this PHP session. So this cookie is accessible to anybody who's looking at your website right now. They can see the username of the person who's logged in. And in our case, there might not be much that they can do with that. But in certain cases, depending on what you put in your cookies, they can use that information to learn a little bit more about how your site is set up and get some information about what they can do to hack into it. And so the way that you prevent that is when we set our cookie, so let's see, we do that in a login.php file. When you set that cookie, we need to set this HTTP only optional parameter to true. And so to do that, we have to go through these other ones. So for a path, we'll just set it to the root directory. That means that the cookie will be accessible from anywhere in our site. That's OK. For domain, we're not going to pass it anything. So we'll just pass null. Whether we only want it to be accessible from secure sites, we'll say false. That's the default for now. You can read some more about this and decide for yourself if it would be a good idea to set that to true. And then the next parameter is HTTP only. And that we want to set to true. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to refresh. I'll just go to another page and back to login to make sure that it refreshed. And now when I log in and click Stay Logged In, just like we did before, and that cookie is set. But now if I try and access it through this document object, I don't see the username cookie anymore. I just see this session ID. And so there's a lot of argument. You'll see if you do some research on this about whether this is actually helps make your site more secure. I can't answer that question. I just know it's something that's very easy to do. And so you might as well do it. So I'm going to stop this lecture here. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about another common attack called cross-site scripting injection. And that's similar to SQL injection, but instead of injecting SQL code through your database, you're injecting JavaScript code into your database. That's going to get executed when we pull that data back out of the database and insert it into the web page. When we create that web page dynamically using PHP. And so we'll see more about that in the next lecture. And we'll see you then.